Hi, I'm Jeff Reese, adult two pastor here at Cross City Church. And I wanna take you on a brief tour of the renovations that have taken place since we've been out with COVID. Down the road here, up the stairs and to the left, we have new classrooms for Espanol, which they have needed. Here in the four year area of the east entrance, we have new wood flooring and I wanna take you down the beautiful stairs. You might remember the stairs that we had here before. They were uh, a little steep and a little challenging. So what we've done is we've actually added a few steps and we've lengthened a few steps. So now it's much safer to uh, descend into the, uh, the area here. New carpet, you'll see, new paint on all the walls. And let me show you a seating area that we have uh, installed. Here, this kind of a gathering area, and you'll see in a moment, you'll see in a moment what, uh, what new things that we've done down the way here. But we have a nice area for gathering. This is just right across from the Fellowship Hall. Let me take you down to show you the new renovations to the Fellowship Hall. And as we're walking, here to the right, a new classroom another new classroom that I'll show you in just a minute, but let's take a peek into the fellowship hall here. Now in the fellowship hall, we've got new colored paint on both sides. We have new carpet, we have new tile, new lighting, new televisions. So we're ready for a connection to come back and for the other events that we have here in the fellowship hall. Already set up for a gathering for social distancing purposes as well. Let me show you that classroom across the way. This will be used for uh, connection classes on Sunday mornings, but also any time that we might have a gathering and need breakout space as well, we've got one of these rooms. Let me hop inside real quick. This room is new television, again, new paint, new carpet, seat about 50 people. And then th this area, this has not been expanded as far as square footage, but right around the corner is new. There was not a hallway here before. And now we have a hallway that connects to this new hallway that was not here before. And you see this wall? This wall, just beyond this wall, is the area that will take us to the new commons area. And from the new commons area, right outside the sanctuary, is where the new uh, coffee bar will be and the playground will be and uh, gathering places will be. But you'll be able to come down this hallway and it will connect to the student's building, to preschool, to children's and to our other adult connection classes. And so this is a significant addition that's made possible by your prayers, by your giving, as we prepare for the future. Also, one more thing let me point out. As some of the renovations have already begun to, to take place here, right here will be an additional elevator that'll take you up to the second and third floor. And on the third floor, there's been renovations there of all the bathrooms and new rooms, new spaces. Looking forward to having you back at Cross City Church for ministry and fellowship. Welcome to Cross City Church at home. Every week, we take these few minutes to focus on God and our relationship with Him. And if you're watching from CrossCity.Church or Facebook, we have online hosts that are here to pray for you and answer questions. Let us know where you're watching from and how we can pray for you. If you're watching for the first time, we're so glad you're joining us. Click the guest link to find out more about us and hear a brief message from our pastor. In addition to these online services, our in-person services are available for everyone who is ready to come back. And we anticipate reopening on-campus options for preschool kids and students, as well as our adult connection groups very soon. So stay tuned for the latest information at crosscity.church safe. Join me in prayer as we get started. Lord, we thank you for the day and a time of gathering to worship you, to express our love for you, to hear from you. Bless our pastor as he preaches the word of God. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is telling us to encourage us and help us to follow you. We tell you that we love you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Bow at his feet, he has done. 
Father, what a moment we have here to worship you in this place. Father, I pray that we would know of your faithfulness. We would know of your greatness. Father, hear these words as we praise you in this place. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet I'm waiting for change to come Knowing the battles won For you have never failed me yet yeah, yeah. Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence, you've never failed me yet, never failed me. I know the night won't last, your word will come to sing your praise again Jesus keep me Jesus you're still enough keep me within your love my heart will sing your praise again still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed your promise still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness Father, when I cannot move, you move. Father, when I cannot see, I can see through your eyes. Father, you give me what I need every day. Father, your faithfulness is what I cling to. I've known that you've moved in my life before. We can sing this now. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it again. I've seen you move, you move the mountain. I will believe, I believe we're gonna see. I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there. 
sing this together. Come on. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still. So glad you're here today. If you're watching for the first time, thanks for joining us. We're here to help real people find real hope and experience real life in Christ. And we'd love to get to know you. Click the guest link to see a message from our pastor and let us know you're here. The kickoff of this school year is going to be different for so many families, but regardless of how class looks, they still have basic things they'll need. Every year, Operation Back to School helps provide the essentials to families in our community that can't afford them or could use a little help. On August 8th, we'll partner with Six Stones to give away these supplies to families, and you can help. You can find out more, donate, and volunteer at the link below. There are so many who give faithfully to the Lord through Cross City. Thanks for your faithfulness. And if you have never given before or haven't in a while, Know that our gifts are a huge part of how we're able to reach people. Join with us today using the link below or by texting the words Cross City to 77977. We're also grateful for everyone who gives their time to serve here. If you're serving in any way at our church, don't miss Replicate, our leadership event that's designed to help all of us learn to hone our leadership skills and serve others well. It'll be hosted online August 9th and for everyone who pre-registers by next Sunday, we'll deliver a box with some surprises and supplies you'll want for the sessions. Don't miss this important time together as we prepare for the fall. Register and see the schedule and choose your breakouts today at crosscity.church replicate. We're continuing our series on the life of Joseph. And today we'll see a big picture of God's forgiveness and how it leads us to restoration. Let's get ready to hear from Pastor John Metter. Thank you so much for joining us for our online experience here as we walk through the uh, Chronicles of Joseph, uh, an incredible series in the book of Genesis. And we're in chapter 45 today. And this chapter really is about the chapter of restoration. We're going to see uh, the Lord bring everything together in the life of Joseph and the relationships be restored in an amazing way. Now, the life of Joseph is a story about how God worked on one man to prepare him for the greatest impact in the world at that time. Uh, you'll see in the message today that God was also working in the life of Jacob, his father, and the ten brothers, and even Pharaoh, but bottom line on, God is working on Joseph's life. Now, the cliff's notes of this whole message series are, are these. Joseph goes from the promise of a favored son with a multicolored coat and the dreams that God gave him to the pit at the hands of his brothers, from the pit to the palace serving Potiphar, and from the palace to prison after being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He goes from the prison to a unique position as he interprets dreams and then ultimately Pharaoh's dream, and from position to prominence in the end. So at this point in the text, Joseph has correctly interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh, and by the wisdom and favor God gave him, his place as the leader of Egypt. The nations have come to Egypt to get food, and Joseph's father sends the ten brothers once, and now again, this time, with Benjamin. So Joseph is going to prevent Benjamin from returning home to Jacob temporarily, and Judah has just been made a heroic sacrificial plea to let him remain instead. We've, we've covered all that. But that's when the emotional dam breaks on Joseph's emotions, and that's where we pick it up right here in chapter 45. So I'm going to read the first uh, four verses of chapter 45, actually the first eight verses of chapter 45, uh, as we set the scene for this chapter. The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 45 of Genesis, Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried, Have everyone go out from me. So he cleared the room. 
So when there was no man with him, when Joseph made himself known to his brothers, he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, if my, is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. They were stunned by this revelation. Verse 4, Then Joseph said to his brothers, Please come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourself because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he made me a father to Pharaoh and lord over all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. So this is the chapter of restoration. And it's brought on by an incredible act of forgiveness on the part of Joseph. And this forgiveness has been emerging slowly. But moved by Judah's obvious love for Jacob and Benjamin, Joseph now is demonstrating complete and transforming restoration for them all, all made possible by forgiveness. Now, there's a tendency to ask, if you've been with us in this series, why so much focus on forgiveness in the story of Joseph? Is that really the big idea of what's happening here? And here's my answer. Yes, absolutely. But it's not just about Joseph's forgiveness of his brothers. It's about something much, much bigger. Get this. We view forgiveness in lowercase. It's kind of small, and it's between two people or groups. It's about hurts and pains and feelings. It's very real, but that's just how we view it. However, forgiveness is bigger than that. It's got a capital letter in the front of it because it has a vertical element to it as well. It's not just between people. It's also between people and God. But it's even bigger than that. Forgiveness is all caps because this is a redemptive story where God extends forgiveness, all caps, to the entire human race. So, yes, it's a pretty big deal. And yes, it's a dominant theme through Joseph's story. It's all connected. Every way you spell forgiveness is tied up with the other aspects of it. And we're messed up if we don't have it in our lives. Joseph has it in his life, and it restores everything in the story. Let's notice some things it restores. First of all, forgiveness opens the door to restored love. In those first four verses, as we open the text there and read it, um, we see that unfold. As mentioned earlier, Joseph has grown more and more friendly towards his brothers after treating them harshly and even falsely accusing them in earlier chapters. We're about to see how we know his forgiveness is complete for all that they've done for him or against him. But here's the first clear indicator. He's deeply affected by Judah's offer to stand in Benjamin's place and is ready to fling open the door to a restored relationship and restored life. Notice he clears the room. In this text, he says, everybody out. He wants some time with his family. Now, this will be the first time he's alone with them in 22 years. The last time was when they sold him into slavery and started the long drought of separation and betrayal. Notice the emotion in this chapter. It's very similar to chapter 37. It says this, he wept so loudly, the Egyptians heard it. Have you ever been there? I have, <laughs> and it reaches deep. When you come to the place of having to forgive someone that's hurt you so badly, it's a deeply emotional moment. I've wept many times over these kinds of circumstances. This, to me, is the weeping of lost time, lost fellowship, and the loss of what might have been. But it's also the tears of putting the offense away. Finally, once and for all, he's going to put it out of mind and out of heart. He's worked through it in private over the many years in the pit, in the palace, in the prison, and he's made the decision to forgive. And now Joseph is ready to embrace them as brothers again. He's ready for restoration. He's going to throw the door open and become open, vulnerable, and embracing to them. Here in verse 4 he says, I am Joseph, your brother. In other words, we're family. We're together here. He's doing all he knows for this horizontal relationship, this person-to-person -person forgiveness to take place. He's taking care of his part in this. He's building the bridge for them to cross over to him now, and it's a powerful moment. And by the way, we all have a part in restoration. So let me ask you a question. It's kind of personal when it comes to this. And this whole text begs the question, have you forgiven your worst enemy? 
How about your closest friend that betrayed you? How about your family member that you're estranged from? Have you forgiven them? Have you opened the door to restoration? It's deep and it's important, just as it's important in Scripture. But Joseph is about to take this even further. And this is the other key to how we know he's truly forgiven them. This is how we can know that we've forgiven someone else too. And here's the principle. Forgiveness enables us to see God's divine purpose. In verses 5 through 8, we see it unfold. And the terminology of what Joseph said is huge. This is where forgiveness has a wider impact and radically affects how he speaks and acts towards them from this moment on. He tells them not to be grieved over their acts of betrayal towards him 22 years before. He's not wanting to cause them pain anymore. Do you remember the first encounters? He was treating them harshly because he could, because the roles were reversed and they were in need now. And he was in power and he had control. He might have wanted to teach them a lesson. That's all understandable to us, but it's not our job to do that to others. We can't say, I will forgive them eventually, but first I'm going to teach them a few lessons. That's not right. That's not what God has called us to do. Joseph is now past all that. Now that he's forgiven, he wants to alleviate their grief and anger against themselves for such wicked treatment all those years earlier. And we know they have that grief. And then, and we're climbing a big mountain here, an even higher position on the ladder of forgiveness is revealed in what he says in the last part of verse 5. This is, this is golden. For God sent me before you to preserve life. And then later on in verse 8, now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Now, we need to understand this really well. Joseph is not blaming God for the acts of betrayal. God is holy. God doesn't make men sin. Instead, Joseph is now crediting God with making even the wickedness of the brothers work redemptively, to work together. He's come to terms with it. It's not, God, why did you let this happen? It's, God, I trust you allowed this for a bigger reason. Now, until a person comes to that place in their trust of God's sovereign ability to redeem what we think is irredeemable, we're going to be enslaved to our anger, our unforgiveness, and our bitterness against others. It's cruel and unusual punishment that we inflict upon ourselves. We actually place ourselves in the pit or in the prison unknowingly. Years ago, I counseled a woman who had a deep and bitter, unforgiving spirit towards her sister. Her sister lived in another part of the world. She'd come in for prayer, prayer because she was physically ill, prayer because she'd had all kinds of emotional breakdown. And in the course of that time of counsel, we discovered this broken relationship. We gathered others in the room. We asked her if she wanted help dealing with that broken relationship and unforgiveness, and she said, yes, I want help. She worked through it, she forgave, and all of a sudden her life really changed, literally, physically, and immediately. She received all kinds of lifting of her spirit. She was healed physically. She restored that relationship with her sister. She had placed herself in a pit unknowingly, and forgiveness had gotten her out. So, in our story, Joseph had shed those chains and is walking in complete freedom. Joseph is no longer looking at the brothers with pain. He's not blaming them for his difficult experiences. He's looking at God with confidence that God is using this in ways beyond anticipation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat this several times today. It's not an easy journey, but it's the path God has us on in every single instance. So have you been able to look at how God took a time when you were personally hurt or betrayed and caused it to work together for good? Can you see God redeeming those terribly difficult times? This is an important moment of forgiveness. It takes the blame off of the person and allows you to see the hurt through the eyes of a sovereign God. Only forgiveness will let you do that. Thirdly, in this text, forgiveness allows grace to be extended. Now look with me in verse 9 at his terminology, at his verbiage to the brothers. He said, Hurry up and go to my father and say to them, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall live in the land of Goshen. You shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will also provide for you, for there are still five years of famine to come, and you and your household and all that you have would be impoverished. Behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth which is speaking to you. 
Now you must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt and all that you have seen, and you must hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. He kissed all of his brothers and wept on them, and afterward his brothers talked with him. So what's coming here is coming from a man who's released the past pain and past anguish and anger and who is seeing things from God's perspective. Joseph is now extending this amazing amount of grace to the brothers. He's blessing them. We see a much fuller picture of just how much he's going to bless them in the next few chapters. But, but note here, he's taking personal action to make sure they know his love and his commitment to them. Present and future. These are the words he speaks. Come down to me. And then he says, and you shall be near me. He also says here in this text, there I will provide for you. And finally, bring my father down to me. These are statements of grace. Regardless of what the brothers have done to him in the past, they are also a very large commitment to their future in spite of what they determined to do with his future 22 years before. He's extending undeserved, unmerited grace. It's beautiful. It's such a clear reminder of the grace that Jesus extends to all of us today, all without merit. We don't deserve it just like they didn't, but Jesus extends it. So now Joseph is going to use his identity, his position, his influence to bless his family. It's a new relationship. It's a new existence between them. It's what restoration looks like. It's how it feels. In verse 15, the brothers have watched this unfold, and the scripture says here in verse 15, in an understated kind of way, his brothers talked with him. They haven't talked in 22 years. While we don't know the exact topic, they had many years to fill in the blanks. This would have been a great conversation. Let me ask you a question. Have you extended grace to someone who's hurt you in the past? If so, remember that restoration looks like this. If not, if you haven't extended it, why would you hold it back? Why would you prevent something this grace-filled from happening? Well, there's a fourth principle we want to get to. This story shows us also that forgiveness gets the attention of a watching world. Jump down to verse 16. <clears throat> Notice something unique in the scripture here. Now, when the news was heard in Pharaoh's house that Joseph's brothers had come, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. Now, this is not the main point of the text. It's, it is, though, an inescapable key here. Pharaoh is watching all this unfold. And he is pleased, as are the servants of Pharaoh. To me, there's no way that Pharaoh, at this level of trust with Joseph, has not heard the story of the brother's betrayal. No Egyptian Pharaoh, as shrewd as he would certainly be, as leader of the land, would turn the reins of the kingdom over to a man whose story he has not heard. How else can Joseph explain how he ended up in Egypt in the first place except by telling the real story? These two, my necessity, Pharaoh and, and Joseph, have spent a great deal of time together. They're working together to rescue the civilized world from famine and hunger. So Pharaoh knows what's unfolding here. And he knows it's been a lifelong separation between Joseph and his family. Anyone would recognize it. So he sees it and he's pleased. It's a great story. But it's more than that. It's also a key indicator to this pagan ruler that the God Joseph worships can do more than interpret dreams. Pharaoh must have been open to know who this God is, especially since God was working through Joseph for the preservation of the entire nation through the famine. This family restoration is yet another witness to the power of Jehovah God. For if Joseph and his brothers cannot ultimately be reconciled, what kind of a testimony is that to their God? There's clearly a personal application here. What's the testimony of your family to the watching world? Can they see reconciliation <clears throat> in your lives? What do you need to bring into, to make that testimony come into existence? What do you need to do to help that happen? That's a question we all ought to be thinking about. The fifth key principle here about this restoration is, number five, forgiveness revives both promise and provision. So I'm going to go down to verse 25 and read the rest of the chapter. Look at it with me in your Bibles. Then they went up from Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. The brothers make this 12-day journey on the back of donkeys back to Canaan and tell Jacob. They told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and indeed he is ruler over the land of Egypt. But he was stunned, and he did not believe them. Remember, there's distrust going on between the ten brothers and the father Jacob. Verse 27, when they told him all the words of Joseph that he had spoken to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, 
The spirit of their father Jacob revived, and Israel said, It is enough. My son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Now, this is not the end of the story. We still have a few chapters left, but there's some stunningly good news here coming to Jacob. This old man, hardened by disappointment and famine and desperation, but surrendered at the end of it all, couldn't at first believe the news about Joseph. But once he did, the scripture says this about him. The spirit of their father, Jacob, revived. Now that line is loaded. From doubt and discouragement, from hunger and anger, from confusion and chaos, Jacob is revived. Now I hope you can see with me in your mind's eye, his downcast head, look up at the news. He's the one that said, I'm gonna to go to my grave bereaved of the loss of my son Benjamin if you take him. But now he's revived. The word basically means to bring back to life. Joseph was resigned, or Jacob was resigned to go to the grave bereaved and in despair, but now he's revived. He's alive again. He's now got something to live for. So Joseph is weeping. The brothers are now talking together and Jacob is revived. This is the collateral effect of forgiveness. God loves a reunion party, and that's what's happening around here. At the end of this chapter, Jacob's words are also powerful. Here's what he says. He says, it is enough. My son Joseph is alive. So let's pause on that line for just a moment. Enough for what? I mentioned last week that Jacob's surrender to God was emerging and that it was difficult, but in the end, Jacob will experience joy. That's what happens when we surrender to God. We will experience joy. So here it is in one conclusive statement for Jacob. It is enough to know that God has been working, though I can't see it. It is enough to know that God's plan is still intact. It's enough to know his goodness overcomes my pain and loss. It's enough to put aside all the hurt and the disappointment. It's enough to enable me to move forward to the next step. It's enough to assure me that God's got this. I love those three words. God's got this. I believe our spirit is like Jacob's. We won't be able to know everything. We can't see the whole picture. However, if we can only know a few things about what God is doing, it's enough. It's enough to get us past all the hurt and disappointment and doubt. We don't have to know it all, and we're not going to know it all. We don't have to have it all in our possession. We don't even have to see its fulfillment. We just need to know. God's got this. As we began this message, I gave you a statement that describes why I believe this is such a consistent and dominant theme in these chapters in Genesis. Here it is again. We view forgiveness in the lower case. It's kind of small, and it's between two groups of people or two people. It's about hurts and pains and feelings. It's very real. However, forgiveness is bigger than that. It's got a capital letter in front of it because it has a vertical element to it. It's not just between people, it's also between people and God, but it's even bigger than that. Forgiveness is all caps because this is a redemptive story where God extends forgiveness to the entire human race. Now, if that statement is true, then this is the message God speaks throughout history and throughout the Bible. And you can see it if you read it well. It's why we see this so clearly in the life of Joseph. Joseph is a type of Christ. He typifies important elements of Christ who later came as a fulfillment of those types. Since that's true, let's take a moment to see how Christ fulfills that type when he came as Messiah. Remember what Jesus said and did is God's full representation on planet Earth. After all, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So in the three years that Jesus' earthly ministry took place, he spoke repeatedly on the subject of forgiveness and to all aspects of it. His opening message was to repent of sin and receive forgiveness from God and he immediately began to personally forgive and restore people. Here's what the scripture says about Jesus' ministry. And they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. That's in Matthew chapter 9, verse 2. While this shocked people that a man, Jesus, seemed to have the power to forgive people of their sin, it also stirred the crowd to come. To the woman who was known as an immoral woman, Jesus said this, For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who has forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins have been forgiven. That's Luke 7, 47. This statement caused those around him to ask a huge question. Who has the authority? 
Who has the power to forgive sin? The answer was clearly obvious. This man has the authority. Jesus has it. Jesus taught his disciples to pray for forgiveness. In verse 12 of Matthew 6, he teaches them to pray and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors or our trespassers, those who trespass against us. In addition, he warned them that he was serious about granting forgiveness to others and he tied it with forgiveness from God. He says in verse 14 of the same chapter, if you forgive others of their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Matthew 6, 14, 15. See, forgiveness is a priority with God. It's His agenda. And it should be ours. But how often do we have to forgive? When asked by Peter about the limits of forgiveness, Jesus made it really clear. He says uh, to Jesus, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Verse 22 of that text says, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. That's Matthew 18, verse 21 and 22. Jesus not only taught it, he practiced it. Right on the cross, nailed there by the very people he was going to say, Jesus said these words, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And the Bible goes on and says, And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. So while he was forgiving them, they continued to do ill treatment towards him, to continue to, to, to mock him in every way, and he was forgiving them while it was taking place. Have you ever forgiven someone while they were still plundering what you had left? Jesus did. Years later, the Apostle Paul reminded the church what Jesus' death had done. It says this in Ephesians Chapter 1, verse 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. Jesus not only taught forgiveness and promised forgiveness, He paved the way for it and made it possible. Paul further declared that it's our message. He said, It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all, 1 Timothy 1. He even made it extremely personal for the disciples and for the church. Here's what he says in Ephesians 4, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. That's a lot of scripture. While Paul acknowledged and rejoiced in forgiveness, he also let the church know that we are to be marked by a forgiving spirit. It needs to be our message that God is out to help us be forgiven and to forgive on a personal level, a spiritual level, and a redemptive level for the sins of the whole world. Here's what it says in our mission uh, that's given to us by God. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. It's to mark our lives. So is rest restoration and forgiveness a big deal in the life of Joseph? Absolutely. Is it to be a big deal in our story? It absolutely is. In fact, it's how you begin your relationship with God, by coming to him and seeking forgiveness. The grace that you saw Joseph show to his brothers is just a picture, a very incomplete picture, of how the grace of Jesus Christ meets every one of us when we come to him seeking forgiveness, seeking to be restored to a relationship with him. He, only he can do that, but he will do that when we come and when we seek forgiveness. You know, at the end of every one of our messages, I give an invitation, and that invite is for you to personally have an encounter with God through Jesus, to come to him by faith, faith in what he's done on the cross to pay for our sins, faith in the extension of eternal life he offers us, faith in his ability to forgive and to give us the promise of eternal life and a new life, and just to be willing to say, Lord Jesus, I want to give you my life. I want to ask that you forgive me and give me this gift. And today I want to lead you in that kind of a prayer. At the end of every one of our messages, I lead in a brief prayer of phrase at a time. And folks that are watching this message have an opportunity to put into practice the decision making and the request of asking God to give us eternal life through Jesus. I hope that you'll take advantage of that right now. Bow with me as we pray together. 
Father, thank you for the opportunity to look at the picture of forgiveness and restoration. And today there are those who want to take that step. I pray that you'll help them walk my faith in you. They can't see you, but they know you're real. Help them today to accept the gift that you offer and hear their prayer right now. I'm going to pause for just a moment and pray this prayer, and I encourage you to pray it with me. Just a phrase at a time. God will hear your prayer. He'll give you forgiveness and eternal life. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the beautiful picture of forgiveness in the Bible. And today I know I need that forgiveness. I ask you today to forgive me of my sins and give me the gift of eternal life. I am placing my trust in Jesus Christ who died for my sins, who was buried and rose again. And today I believe what he did was enough to give me this forgiveness. So I turn away from my sins and everything else I've trusted in. And I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. Today I ask you to be my Savior. And today I also ask you to be my Lord. I choose to follow you. Thank you for this gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, one of our greatest joys is to hear from people who have made decisions or been impacted in some way by our online experiences and the messages that you hear. So I would encourage you to click the box beneath the screen. That lets you tell us what kind of a decision you've made or how God has spoken to you today. Because it's so important that we walk together, we're going to offer you other resources to help you grow in your spiritual life. Someday I hope to meet you. And until then, we look forward for you joining us next week at this time. God bless. Take a second and evaluate where you have relationships that need restoration and where you may need to extend grace and forgiveness. In a few moments, we'll put some questions on the screen. Take some time to consider how this message from Joseph's life applies to you and discuss the questions with your family and your friends. Then next week, join us again for worship. We'll continue to offer online and in-person options. You can read more at crosscity.church/safe. We can't wait to worship with you again next week.